All right, then we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'm Jay Shellstone. I am third generation in concrete quality control. My grandfather started a testing lab in New Orleans in 1908. Then my father went to work for him when he was 13 years old, sweeping the floors. And then when I got out of college, I wasn't sweeping floors, but I went to work for my father. So I just realized uh, next year will mark 40 years that I've been in the industry. 35 of those years I've been dealing with quality control and concrete mix designs and computers. So I go back a little ways in uh, the concrete industry, but uh, some of you who are in quality control may have seen some of the work that my father has done. Anyway, today we're going to talk about what's new in the industry for concrete technology. And I realized when I started pulling this presentation together that it's not really a whole lot different from what, hap uh, what I talked about last year as far as general topics, but things have changed dramatically in some of these areas, so we're going to get into that. Um, so, our industry objective, we're going to talk about some of the things that are happening in the concrete industry. What's hot in concrete right now? Sustainability still seems to be a big driving factor. And the problem with sustainability is that the efforts there are being driven by people outside of the concrete industry. If you've ever been involved in any of the ACI or ASTM practices, you know that changes in the codes and standards can take 10 years to take effect for people to get them approved and all that. Sustainability, it can happen before you even know that it started. So all the changes in LEED, LEED 4 should now be in full effect, I believe. Um, health product declarations. Uh, or first off, how many of you are familiar with environmental product declarations? Okay, not many. This is something that started on the east. Co I mean, on the west coast, and basically what it does is try to identify the impact of concrete or of a concrete mix design on the environment. You may have heard that concrete is responsible for. Uh, at one point, they were saying 10% of the global CO2 production. Um, in the ready mix and in, uh, in, in manufacturing processes, well, actually, that was cement was supposed to be 10%, not concrete. But concrete got a bad rap because of cement, and now they've recently done a study that says it's more like 1% of the total manufacturing CO2 output. So it was really overblown. But anyway, because of that, people were concerned about the impact of concrete on the environment, and they came up with, with this thing called an environmental product declaration, which is sort of like the nutrition information on the back of a can of food, but it talks about how much CO2 is released because of this yard of concrete, the energy consumption, the water consumption, uh, the NOx gases that are generated, all these different things that will impact um, the environment. But there's something new, relatively new, called the health product declaration that looks at all the hazardous materials that are found in concrete or other items to identify what hazardous materials. And we all know, for example, or I guess I know, for example, that mercury is found just about everywhere. It's just in very, very tiny quantities. And mercury is also found in concrete. And so when you say there's mercury in concrete, people get all scared, but they don't realize that the mercury is totally encapsulated in the concrete, so it's not going to impact anybody. And that's what these health product declarations are about. Uh, how many of you are concrete producers? Okay, everybody here. Green plant initiatives. Have any of your uh, uh, batch plants tried to get uh, green plant certification? where they keep track of all the water and try and put plants all around the uh, green plants all around the uh, uh, plant, the batch plant and all that. Okay, anyway, these are things that start on the west coast and then they slowly creep across the country. And um, with LEED, how many of you have done LEED projects? Okay, a couple. This is where a owner gets uh, points for being uh, environmentally responsible in their construction and concrete is one of the ways that you can get lead points but lead is changing the most recent uh, version of lead the best way to get lead points is by creating what are called these environmental product declarations and then file them with a the contractor who sends them to the owner and then the owner can get lead points for his project so this is one of the things that's hot in concrete BIM Building Information Modeling. Anybody hear about BIM? Okay, a couple of you have. Um, 
one of the really snazzy things that's happened over the uh, the decades, you know. Engineers used to design and architects used to design on paper. They had these drafting boards and they These architectural and engineering designs are getting sent over to the contractor so the contractor can do, for example, takeoffs on the bill of materials that are in the building. Or the contractor can organize and schedule the delivery of his materials to the job site. So the contractor is basically building a virtual building with scheduling and everything alongside the virtual design that the architect and engineer have caught up with. And the benefit to this is that at the end of the project, the owner can receive this virtual building and then maybe 30 years from now he says, I want to put three more stories on top of my high rise. We know everything that went on about that building and we can add three stories on in the, architect in the structural design and see based on the compressive strengths of the materials in that building whether or not that building will support the extra three floors without, um, uh, without additional structural support. Well, now that's finally getting down to the uh, that's finally getting down to the level of the concrete producer and the um, uh, well the precast uh, pre-stressed concrete institute has already started in with BIM and providing precast elements uh, that tie in with BIM. So we're basically we've gone from the uh, virtual design to the virtual building, and now we're starting to look at the virtual materials that will go into that building. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Nuclear uh, construction. There, uh, we're going to talk more about this too. We are finally starting to look at getting new nuclear plants. Anybody have a nuclear power plant near them? I mean, uh, outside of Fort Worth, we've got one at Glen Rose that uh, has been up there for, what, 30 years now or 40 years. But we're starting to build nuclear plants. Shortages. Anybody get put on allocation for fly ash or cement? Yeah, it's happening more and more frequently. And driver shortages, other things like that. Changes in codes and standards. Um, believe it or not, these codes and standards that I just said take 10 years to change, well, they've been working on them every, every year, usually twice a year, and making changes. So when these codes and standards change, it changes how you have to respond to the concrete. Mobile computing. Everybody has a cell phone. Most people have smartphones. If you were like my father was, even when he died, he still had a flip phone. He didn't want a smartphone. But we have smartphones, we have tablets. So mobile computing, talking about the uh, Mobile Connect products that we have, it's getting to be more and more of a big deal. Infrared cameras. We're going to talk, talk about that a little bit. 3D printing. Anybody look at a 3D printing with concrete on YouTube or something? getting to be more important. And a focus on the future of concrete. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit too. So these are what I think are some of the hot buttons right now. Of course there are others that you can throw in here, but these are the ones that caught my attention. These are the ones that I think are most likely to impact the concrete quality control department. So let's go ahead and look at these. Uh, oh, we also have some other ongoing issues. Performance specifications, switching from prescriptive specifications to performance specifications. Uh, NRMCA quality initiatives. Uh, the NRMCA is getting more and more behind helping concrete producers be better quality oriented organizations. 500 year durability requirements. Anybody run into 100 year or 500 year durability requirements? I see these a lot, especially on overseas jobs or jobs where they're out on the coast where you've got uh, chlorides and so forth. A demand for submittals with 
a lot of concrete producers that were previously doing residential concrete during the downturn, they started getting into commercial concrete and they discover, oh, we need to start sending out submittals for our concrete mixes before projects. Do any of, are any of you involved in producing submittals for projects? A couple of you? You're seeing more and more demand for submittals, I take it? And more and more complex submittals too. Yep. So let's go back and look at sustainability again. With all the issues of global warming, um, environmental impact, uh, greenhouse gases, and um, depletion of resources, we are looking at um, putting more and more CO2 into the air every year. Here was a projection uh, on CO2, and you can see that, uh, well, here's the temperature anomalies over the last 100 years and projecting over the uh, immediate future, the next, what, s almost 90 years, how they expect global warming to impact the world based on d some different studies. at global warming and the contribution of concrete to global warming. Now concrete is recognized as the most widely used man-made material in the world. It's second only to water, which is not man-made. But we basically use about one yard of concrete per person in the entire country. That's ma every man, woman, and child, babies included. And so that's what we do. For every ton of cement clinker produced, almost a ton of CO2 is produced as well. And CO2 is a, a, a greenhouse gas. Half of the CO2 comes from the fact that we have kilns that have to have fuel that's burning to be able to generate the cement. The other half comes from the fact when you heat up the raw materials and um, uh, to make cement, you're actually driving CO2 off of those materials. And like I said, previous estimates were CO2 uh, cement provided between 5 and 10 percent of the CO2 of all manufacturing processes. Now there was a recent study in, I think it was released either in concrete construction or concrete producer that said that number is more like 1 percent. Uh, Another thing is we've got company, countries like China and India with gigantic populations, expanding populations that are way behind in developing their infrastructure, but they're trying to catch up. And so for China and India to reach the same level of concrete consumption as the U.S., that one cubic yard per person, production will have to remain at current levels for about 16 years. And what that means is basically China and India are going to be going full bore with their concrete production if they have enough money available. And that means we're not going to be able to impact the CO2 production of the two largest cement consumers in the world. Okay? So they are going to be going full bore trying to catch up with their infrastructures. So there's a lot that we can't do. There was a study on the Kyoto, uh, there was a, uh, a meeting at, in Kyoto that released what was called the Kyoto Protocol, which was uh, commitments from various countries to minimize global uh, generation of greenhouse gases. The U.S. refused to sign it because China was exempt. China basically accounts for about half the, C half the cement production and consumption in the entire world. And here China was exempt. That means there's very little the U.S. can do to offset the Chinese contribution to CO2 other than improve our own processes and hope those improved processes go over to China. There have been other things like Architecture 2030, which is aiming to, uh, to have carbon neutral construction by the year 2030. It's a goal. We're not sure they're going to actually be able to get there, but that's the goal. LEED, like I said, is promoting more environmentally friendly options. We have all, all remember about the EPA, EPA's efforts to, uh, or considering fly ash as a hazardous material. Now that's all been resolved. Fly ash has not been labeled as a hazardous material, so we can still use it if we can get it. Restrictions on water runoff. I know this is really big in Texas. You cannot have a drop of water runoff of a concrete plant in Texas. I don't care if you've got 100 year rains going, you cannot have any water running off of your concrete plant in Texas. And I assume a lot of the rest of you have run into that as well. Uh, the environmental product declarations that I was talking about earlier and the health product declarations, these are all things that are coming about. They are not controlled by the concrete industry. They are not happening on concrete time. 
they are happening on somebody else's time. And that means that compared to the concrete industry, these things are moving at the speed of light. So if you don't know what they are, you ought to at least be aware of them because they can be impacting your company over the uh, not too distant future. Environmental product declarations are based on a European procedure for calculating the impact of a material on the environment and they create something called product category rules that defines how you calculate these environmental product declarations. If you're interested in finding out more about this, you can go to www.carbonleadershipforum.org and find out more about the product category rules. Now, to give you an idea of how fast these things move, um, I consider myself pretty aware of what's going on in the concrete industry, who's doing what, and normally I would find out about, uh, if there's a change in the building code, I would find out about it within six months or so of the proposed change and I would be able to keep up with it. Well, I didn't find out about the development of the product category rules until three weeks before the period of public comment was about to close. So all the meetings had already been held, all the decisions had been made before I ever even found out about it and I just barely had time to even look at the proposed product category rules before they were ratified. That's how fast these things move. So, you know, for the man in the field, you know, it's all a done deal way before you even hear about it. So there are changes over time, so you might want to check into these things. Now, U.S. Concrete, one of the U.S. Concrete divisions called Central Concrete out in California, worked with a company called Climate Earth to develop the first environmental product declarations for concrete in the U.S. And then the NRMCA became the first what they called a program operator that certified those environmental product declarations. So that you've got a process that you have to go through to get these things done. And basically if you want to be able to provide lead points on your projects, you're going to have to start looking at environmental product declarations. Lead 4 will let you have a half point if you use something called an industry EPD. But if you develop your own EPDs at a cost, then you can get a full point. Now these industry EPDs were determined by t getting information from a bunch of concrete producers, bringing it all together and calculating average EPDs. The only way you can use those though is if you are a member of the National Ready Mix Concrete Association and if your company provided information for the EPD database. Now I'm not sure that NRMCA is going through the uh, first revision for the industry-wide EPDs. I don't know if it's closed out yet but if you don't get in the, the first revision of the EPDs, you're going, in order to be able to use these, you're going to have to wait until the next go-round comes where you enter your own information, get your own inter information in. So things are happening, and if you're not aware of them, you get left behind. If you're not doing lead projects, you don't need to worry about it so much. This, like I said, this product category rule process is in constant flux. There have been changes in the product category rules as organizations like NIST and ASTM get involved. So you still have an opportunity. But I go to all these, well, I go to the ASTM meetings for concrete. And again, I was sort of blindsided by some of the changes that occurred here. Then it may be that you're not going to be competitive in the future market. Uh, some places like Central, uh, Central U.S., it seems like they're more on lead projects, Ohio, Chicago, Illinois, uh, uh, Michigan, and so forth. As we get farther away from uh, the West Coast and far away from um, the, the Great Lakes area, it seems like lead isn't so, so important anymore, but you may have some lead projects coming up. Um, yeah. Uh, ASTM and the Carbon Leadership Forum both have become uh, uh, program operators for EPDs. Uh, more companies have generated EPDs. Ceratec, which makes a non-clinker based uh, uh, cementitious product, Semex, Argos, uh, Titan, ReadyMix, Cadman have all developed EPDs and they're even more now. If you want more information on EPDs, the NRMCA has a web page, nrmca.org EPD program and you can find out lots of information about EPDs. 
By the way, you will be able to download this presentation uh, after I get it uploaded to the, the conference website. Command QC has recently developed a capability in conjunction with Climate Earth where if you work with Climate Earth to have them generate your EPDs, when you go into our Command QC program, you can pull up a list of your concrete mix designs, highlight the ones that you want EPDs for, punch a button, we send it directly to Climate Earth, and real time, within like five minutes, they will return EPDs to you so that you can include on your submittals. But there's a whole setup process that has to go through, so that's not just you know an instantly instant pop-up thing. So it's becoming a lot more streamlined for being able to produce EPDs. The first ones that came out were very expensive and very time-consuming to produce, and we people have gotten better and better at being able to do this. Now, let's look at um, EPD determinations. They're basically based on raw materials, what the cement that you're using, the source of your aggregate supplies, the um, source of your admixtures, transportation costs, manufacturing processes, how much energy your plants consume, how much water, transporting the product, your concrete, to the job site, and you produce what's called a life cycle assessment, which takes all the greenhouse gas contributions from all these different operations and puts them into a, a sort of summary that later they can use to calculate the actual impact of each of your concrete mixes on the environment. Um, we are doing something called cradle to gate uh, rather than cradle to gate, uh, cradle to site. In other words, we are developing our EPDs starting at the source of the raw materials until the concrete's ready to leave your plant. And that's where the whole EPD process stops. Some people are looking at doing it from cradle to site, so it includes the delivery of your concrete to the job site. But that's not what we're doing in the U.S. right now. Um, the EPDs look at the carbon footprint. Uh, how much CO2 is produced, energy consumption from both renewable and non-renewable resources, water use, um, ozone depletion, how the uh, greenhouse gases impact the ozone layer, acidification, acid rain and all that, eutrophication, which is the uh, production of NOx gases, nitrous oxide, nitri I think nitrous trioxide and all the others, um, ozone creation. We've got a problem. Uh, you know, you've probably heard about ozone depletion of the ozone layer, and people are all concerned about that. But then you get on the weather report that you've got an ozone action day, and that means in your local city, you're making more ozone than is healthy for people in that environment. So somehow, we've got to figure out how to get all that ozone around the cities back up to the, um, uh, up to the upper atmosphere, and I understand that takes decades to do. So uh, right now, there's a definite imbalance there. Um, and then the toxicity, like I said, things like acid rain. So that's what these EPDs are designed to do to help identify the impact of concrete on these different environmental conditions. And if you haven't started hearing about them, you ought to at least look up some of the basics on them so that you can be aware when your company winds up competing against a company that does have environmental product declarations, you may be out of the running altogether. Oh, and particulate emissions as well. So, um, like I said, a, uh, oh, the health product declaration, like I said, M identifies the materials people will be ex uh, exposed to, and it compares them to a red list of hazardous materials, like cancer-causing materials, uh, things like heavy metals, and how they will impact it. But we have to recognize that concrete encapsulates these materials so that actually the public is not exposed to those materials, even though they're contained in concrete. Uh, for example, carpets have a lot of harmful materials in them, but when you vacuum a carpet, you're taking up a lot of those harmful materials and you're putting them into the air while the vacuum cleaner is sucking up all the dust. So there are impacts there. You've heard of sick building syndrome and all that. That's going to be much more impacted by things like carpets and paint than it will be by concrete. Um, it's still under development, but it's coming. They're looking at this in California. And if you're interested in playing around with all this CO2 generation and you want to get a very basic idea of what all's involved and why you want to hire somebody to do all this for you, the NRMCA has something called a carbon calculator that looks at things like your sources of materials, your fleet, 
what kind of fuel you use, your plant energy consumption, and you, for yourself, can calculate your own CO2 generation for your concrete mix designs. And if you take the time to go through all this for one concrete mix design, you're probably not going to want to do the second mix design on your own. <laughs> so if you want to, um, these are the areas that it covers. I thought I had the web page, but if you go to the um, sustainability section of the IMC website, you can find that carbon calculator. I actually had to type in in the search section carbon calculator and it popped up because I couldn't find the, the actual link to it. Um, now, some additional concrete initiatives as far as sustainability goes. The NRMCA has a Green Star plant certification. So if you make your plant look all pretty so that people driving by it won't just see a whole bunch of dusty trucks driving in and out, uh, you know, you put plants around the job site, you can get a plant certification, Green Star plant certification. And then you get an award from NRMCA at their annual meeting and so forth. Reuse of process water. Um, now this is getting to be more and more required. When you wash out your trucks, then you're stuck with all this process water. You can actually use that back in your new concrete if you do it properly. Top-loaded concrete. This is concrete's dirty little secret. You get some fresh concrete back. It's still somewhat plastic and uh, you don't want to just throw it out. You can actually use that. So you put a little bit more concrete on top of it and then you send it out to another job site, usually like a house slab or a patio or a driveway or something like that, something that's not critical. Well, ASTM right now has just recognized the return fresh concrete as a material, and the next step is to going to be to provide the procedures that you have to go through to take that material and reuse it in new concrete. So. This is something that the industry has done probably for the last 15, 20 years, but now we're codifying it to say the right way and the wrong way to do it. Because this process has gotten a bad name from people who have not done it the right way. So it's a major problem. Uh, use of recycled crushed concrete. I don't know if you're aware, but ASTM now allows that 100% of your concrete aggregate could be crushed concrete. And that's a scary thought. Usually you're limited to having like 10% of your uh, concrete aggregates be crushed concrete. And that's usually the limit for making good quality concrete. But when you look at the definitions in ASTM, strictly speaking, an aggregate producer could provide you with 100% crushed concrete that still meets the ASTM requirements and would just totally screw up your concrete mixes. But that's allowable by ASTM now. Certification of blended cements. They use these all the time over in Europe and South America, even up in Canada. These are where you pre-blend the cement and the fly ash together, uh, or cement and slag, especially with some of the difficulties in getting cement, I mean fly ash or slag, uh, the cement mills can actually handle it more efficiently. So ASTM is allowing the use of blended cements. Addition of powdered limestone. Anybody ever use powdered limestone in their concrete mixes? especially for self-consolidating concrete mixes. This can be a great addition because it's a whole lot cheaper than cement and it can make your concrete mixes more cohesive so you don't get segregation with self-consolidating concrete. So that's another new thing. Development of a whole new brand of uh, fibers, I mean of, of binders, non-cementitious binders like cement, uh, non-cementitious, non-cementitious, non-clinker based cements. Um, instead of the typical what we call A-light cements, producing B-light cements that are less energy intensive to produce. There's a whole generation of those. And if you're interested in that, you can find out more if you go to the MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub. It's cshub.mit.edu. And it's sort of a joke there. Concrete Sustainability Hub, CSH, which is calcium silicate hydrate, and that's the material that makes concrete hard. So it's a joke. Anyway, it, it, there's a lot of information that's over there. And also you can contact the Environmental and Sustainability Committees for NRMCA, ACI, and it's getting to be more and more encroaching in ASTM. Okay? Next, I, want, I spent a whole lot of time on sustainability because that's really the big dog with the big tail that's wagging the concrete industry. Now I want to talk about BIM. Like I said, BIM started off with creating virtual models of buildings, designs, and it's now at the point where the contractor's information is getting interfaced. 
It helps schedule when different materials and different uh, trades are going to be doing their work. And it connects up to the, structure, uh, to the virtual design. The next step is going to be to connect the materials and the test results up to this virtual virtual construction and virtual design. In fact, at the next ASTM meeting, I'm going to be leading a, um, a luncheon discussion on how BIM is going to impact ASTM and the materials and testing that goes on at ASTM. So it's getting to the level of the concrete producer. What does this mean to you? It means that you're going to have to start providing your batch ticket information electronically or your concrete tests or aggregate tests electronically. And if you can't provide it electronically, you may need to get your suppliers to provide it electronically. So it's a whole new ball game when it comes to taking materials and tests and integrating and ha basically what you're doing is you're building an entire virtual building. So in addition to deliver the, delivering the building, the contractor is going to have to deliver the virtual building. To give you an idea of how important this is, I um, talked with somebody with the Corps of Engineers and he said that within three years after a Corps of Engineers project is complete, they have no access to that data anymore. It's been filed, nobody can find it, it's been thrown out. By, make, by using BIM and making things electronic, hopefully with all the backups that are done, that information will still be available. Of course, somebody might be trying to plug a, um, uh, a Betamax tape into a CD-ROM drive somewhere, but somehow that information is going to be available in zeros and ones so that hopefully it can be translated. So BIM is something you're going to be, need to be aware of, and what it means is you're going to need to be providing not only real concrete, but virtual concrete and all the information that goes behind it as well. Um, what BIM does, like I said, you've got the A&E that's developing the design. It goes out to the contractor who builds the building. Well, now suppliers are going to need to get in on the act, too. Contractor integration with the uh, structural design. Okay, shortages. Anybody been on allocation at any point in the last year? Fly ash, cement, okay. Some of you have, yeah. It's getting harder and harder to get access to fly ash, even aggregates. Uh, I know that in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we have, we all wind up using uh, blended sands and we don't have any more gravel to speak of. We're using crushed stones, so aggregates are becoming less and less available. Uh, Florida, they're bringing uh, material down from Canada. So is San Diego. And uh, Florida, they're also bringing uh, aggregates up from South America. So we're running into shortages of all of our materials, cement, fly ash. If you talk to the American Coal Ash Association, they'll say, there's no shortage of fly ash. We have mountains of fly ash. It's just all stuck in landfills somewhere. And all we have to do is dig it out and reprocess it so that you can use it in concrete. Well, I've got some land I want to sell you as soon as the tide goes out. Um, yeah, that may be true, but it's going to be a while before the supply of those reprocessed materials catches up with the demand. And even at some point, the supply of those materials is going to run out. One of the things that I think is going to have to happen is we're going to have to have a better system of qualifying locally available waste materials and to, for use in concrete. You know, asphalt, they'll throw in ground tires, they'll throw in glass, crushed glass, all kinds of stuff. We can't do that in concrete for the most part. But for example, now that trade is open with Cuba, Cuba grows a lot of sugar cane. And there have actually been studies saying that you can burn the sugar cane and take the ash from that and use that in concrete. So I'm wondering if now there's going to be a source of sugar cane ash coming out of Cuba, especially to provide product to the coastal regions around the U.S., south, southeastern United States. So we have to address the impact of the loss of materials on concrete. Also, we've got equipment shortages. Uh, back when the economy was first turning around, Pierre Villery uh, um, accurately predicted there was going to be a shortage of ready-mix trucks. 
and there was for a little while a shortage of ready mix trucks, but also a shortage of drivers. Now that the uh, uh, price of oil is down so much, we're getting a lot of uh, drivers coming back from the oil fields and now we're, it's a little bit easier. But overall, we're losing qualified personnel to work in the construction industry. So we've got a shortage not only of materials but also uh, and equipment, but also personnel. So we need to work to train uh, people to come in and work in the concrete industry. And of course there's a lot of stuff going on internationally. During the period when China was building the Three Gorges Dam, you couldn't get reinforcing steel in a lot of areas because all the um, steel for recycling was going to go over to China where they could build uh, rebar for the Three Gorges Dam. And all the container ships were going over to China and so on. It was really hard to get materials. But now that's all slacked off because of the cooling down of the worldwide economy. ACI codes and standards. Recently ACI 318, the building code, was redesigned. The building code was originally meant as instructions from ACI to the designer. But a whole lot of construction stuff got thrown in there over the years also. Now ACI has taken all those instructions to the contractor out of the building code and put them over into ACI 301 so that all the strength over design stuff for calculating over design of mixes, that's no longer an ACI 318, it's just an ACI 301. ASTM C94 is allowing, for example, the use of uh, the addition of water in transit. That has been recognized, that was just voted on. Um, it no longer has fixed limits for the number of revolutions for your truck. Um, and we're working on getting the limitation on age of concrete removed. Um, we now allow for the use of electronic tickets. It used to be that ASTM required that batch tickets be printed, stamped, or written. Now we can use electronic tickets, which is going to make it easier for us to qualify for BIM. And of course the use of recycled fresh concrete, the top loaded concrete that I was talking about. ASTM C33 in case you're not aware, has taken the uh, limits on the minus 200 sieve that are allowed in aggregates and moved it over to the grading table, which means that if you can show that you can produce good quality concrete, even if the aggregate has grading limits that exceed those in AST, ASTM C33, you can still use it. For example, Louisiana sand has never met ASTM. It's always been outside of the grading requirement. percent passing the 100 sieve. Normally you're limited to 10 percent. This had 38 percent and we made great concrete out of it. Of course it took a whole lot of cement but we did it. So anyway that change in ASTM is going to make a lot of uh, manufactured sand producers very happy because now you can use their material as long as you can show you can make good quality concrete out of it. Mobile computing, we've already talked about this a little bit. It's not just truck tracking and statusing now. It's things like all the Mobile Connect products. We've got Mobile Ticket, Mobile Commerce, Mobile Sales, Mobile Job Site. You can find out more about those over in the exhibit hall. Truck telemetry, the McNeilis announcement, being able to track things like water addition in transit, being able to track concrete slump while the, concrete's in the, uh, um, while the concrete is in the drum. That people like uh, five cubits being able to uh, take all this information and send it back to a central database, putting it on the cloud. Big deal. Uh, but it is a big deal because that makes that information accessible to a lot more people and you can do a lot more with it. And um, we hopefully will soon have uh, remote data access for quality control data. I mean, I'm not saying that's a product announcement, it's not, but that's my personal hope that we'll get that soon. The future, and again this is not a new product announcement, will have advanced mobile QC access, head mounted displays. You know, um, I was giving the, uh, as part of this uh, presentation I'm working on for ACI on the future of uh, computers and concrete, we were talking about examples. One of the possibilities, I could have one of these new augmented reality glasses, sort of like Google Glass was, and I'd be able to look at a concrete truck and automatically pop up the batch contents of that truck, what time it was batched, what plant it came out of, what the current slump was, how old that concrete was. Now this is 
pie in the sky type stuff right now, but who knows, 5, 10, 15 years from now, that may be happening. So mobile computing is a great opportunity in concrete. Now, infrared. This is sort of one of my side interests. Um, have any of you ever uh, seen the use of infrared cameras on construction sites? Okay. Well, it used to be these things were like $5,000, $10,000. Now there's a company called FLIR that has an iPhone 5 attachment that will do infrared imaging from your cell phone. And you can do things like detect slab uh, lam delaminations. As far as I know, you can detect uh, concrete and uh, material levels in trucks and bends. You can monitor your cement temperature, your concrete temperature. You could look at an engine and see where the hot spots are with it. Or for electrical maintenance, I've seen examples of people looking at uh, breaker panels, and you can look and see where the hot breaker is that is about to fail. So infrared has the potential, I think, to be a really cool thing in the concrete industry. Even looking at a drum of a truck and seeing how much concrete is left in that truck. That could be pretty cool. 3D printing. I guess everybody here has probably gone onto YouTube and clicked on one of the videos and watched them do 3D printing of a, of a concrete structure. Here's an example of one. They've been doing a lot of this, uh, I think in Minnesota or someplace, as well as over in Europe. But there's, everybody's used to seeing the thing where the, the 3D printer is spitting out this mortar or grout that sort of looks like toothpaste as it goes around and builds up the building. There's another kind of 3D printing that I think has a lot of potential where you set out a thin layer of a mixture of dry sand and cement, like I'm talking about a quarter inch layer, and then right behind it you come with a water spray bar and you can control the water spraying down onto that dry cement and sand. And then you go in and you start building up whatever structure you're trying to build a quarter inch by a quarter inch. You just keep going around. The thing, and then when you're all through, you take an air hose and you blow out all the extra dry cement and sand that didn't get water sprayed on it. The thing about this is for the precast industry, you can develop some incredibly intricate structures. You know, like sunscreens that have look like honeycomb or something like that. You can do, uh, or that looks like um, the uh, wrought iron work. You can do some amazing structures, especially if you mix in some fibers with some of these things. So, um, anyway, I think there's a lot of potential here that people are going to be interested on. Now, the future of concrete. This is something that's attracting a whole lot more attention. Rick's involved in this, Rick Gilton in the back is involved in this at uh, the ASTM level. ACI also has the Strategic Development uh, The cost of, con I mean, the production of concrete in the year 2050. Just imagine, we've got driverless cars that Google is doing. What would happen if 35 years from now, you had a driverless concrete truck that would show up at the job site with no driver, and then for the last 100 yards, it would send up a periscope with a camera, and somebody sitting in your main office downtown would back the concrete up to where it needs to go. Or maybe even still, there's a sensor on the back of the truck, the truck gets to the job site, somebody grabs that sensor, puts it on the concrete bucket, the truck automatically backs up to where the sensor is, sticks the chute two feet past the sensor, and then starts dispensing concrete. These things are all distinctly possible. Charles here goes out and does drone readings, uh, drone uh, pictures, videos, with his drone of his construction sites. You know, this is not too far from, you know, actually being useful on the job site. Uh, I've seen things like drones going around and doing stockpile quantity takeoffs and so forth. Um, so these are all possibilities. There's this big interest in the future of concrete. Another thing about the future of concrete, we're going to have an ongoing competition with the wood industry. Things like the woods, Rethink Wood, where they're uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, they're looking at building, I think it's up to 16 story buildings out of wood laminated wood timbers and now the concrete industry is fighting back with the build with strength program but we're going to be con having an increasing battle against the wood industry to maintain our market share. 
manpower shortages like I talked about. Not only the lack of manpower as far as um, being available from other industries, but the lack of trained manpower. We've got programs like the Concrete Industry Management Program, and as near as I can tell, they're, they're doing a great job, but we still don't have enough people coming out of those programs. Um, nuclear construction. The USA produces more than 30% of the world's nuclear power, but there have been, uh, we currently have 104 nuclear reactors, which is 19% of our total electric output, but almost no nuclear construction in the last 30 years. Now there are two nuclear plants coming online with plans to build 24 uh, uh, by the year uh, uh, or the near future, uh, four to six by 2020. But the trouble is a lot of the, for example, certification of nuclear inspectors, that basically went away in the, in the mid 80s and now we have no program for certifying concrete inspectors for the nuclear industry. ACI has just, I believe, announced a new one that is going to be the basis for that nuclear inspector program, but it's only part of it. So because of the, the decrease in natural gas prices, nuclear construction may be slowing down, but it still is in the future. Uh, the specifications that are used for nuclear are out of date. Level 5 nuclear inspector certification is no longer available. Um, and there are new products and materials available for construction that the nuclear specifications don't take into consideration. Plus seismic codes and standards have changed. We have problems with ASR on some nuclear plants up in the northeast and some other chemical reactions that are going on. So ACI is working to improve field certifications for field and lab technicians and this concrete quality technical manager, which was, I believe, just approved uh, by ACI. NRMCA is also offering certifications on concrete technologists, level two, three, and now four, quality certification and quality management classes. So some of the ongoing stuff, the NRMCA's P2P program, switching from performance speci uh, prescriptive specifications to performance is still ongoing, but it's sort of slow going still. But you can find information on the NRMCA website on that. Basically what we're trying to do is get engineers away from designing, specifying maximum water cement ratios when they're not required. Uh, ACI has a performance concrete committee. ASTM is switching to allow for more performance opera uh, operations for materials and specifications and uh, the NRMCA has a model specification review program where if you've got a, an engineer who continually designs with prescriptive specifications, turn those over to NRMCA and they will provide a performance alternative. Plus the NRMCA has a lot of quality initiatives. If you go to nrmca.org slash quality, you'll see a lot about these, including a quality award, a quality survey. They've got a free quality management plan required you to submit a quality plan as part of your concrete submittal. This does it all for you. You just fill in the blanks. And it's like 50, 75 pages, I think. There's an increased emphasis from NRMCA on quality control training, which basically was missing from, I would say, 1985 until about five years ago. Because NRMCA recognizes that for concrete producers to be competitive against all this fancy wood stuff and steel and to have the performance specifications, quality control people have to be qualified to provide quality concrete. 500 year durability. Um, I think this all started when um, we were doing a lot of work internationally and my dad did work over in the Middle East and they would put up a high-rise office building or a high-rise apartment building and then 10 years later the balconies would start to corrode and they would have to abandon the balconies and some entire buildings were uh, uh, evacuated within I believe 15 years and so now there are these issues about specifying 500 year durability there's a lot of modeling going on and predicting durability but you have to be aware of it and you have to get involved in it New tests on permeability, chloride diffusivity, abrasion resistance, and alkali silica reactivity. 
and there are a lot of complex models that you can pay a lot of money for or hire consultants for like the stadium program that predicts chloride penetration or you can go with the free stuff that was developed by Federal Highway Administration that it's not great but at the same time it can give you an idea like Texas Concrete Works that can predict heat buildup for mass concrete you can look at hyperpave that will predict cracking in pavements and you can look at Life 365 which will help you compare multiple concrete mixes for expected life durability under aggressive environments these are all free programs some of them are some of them were developed like 15 years ago and there's been no maintenance on them so they're a little bit harder to get but they're all available out there submittals we know that submittals are getting more and more complicated information on chloride shrinkage ASR uh, over 50 percent of concrete mix submittals contain historical test data which is bad news for the you, those of you that can't get concrete tests from the laboratories and certification of materials is required and so on and, and command QC can help you with that so anyway we've talked about a bunch of stuff about what I think is hot in concrete some of its fun some of its not so much fun but these are all things that I think we're going to be facing within the next um, five to ten years so you uh, ought to at least be aware of these things and consider them so if there are any questions I have about two minutes I think and also I'd like you to complete if you would your evaluation oh where's the sign-in sheet and has everybody signed in on the sign-in sheet um, I've added a quick code here you should have gotten an email this morning that has the link to the uh, uh, seminar session evaluation but I've added a quick code if you want to do that and when I get this uploaded to the ACI uh, to the uh, command Alcon conference website the handout will be available as well so if you use quick codes you can grab that information here any questions I've covered a lot of